in Scotland, we have 35 species of butterfly, which regularly breed here. And most of them are here all year round, so they're completely resident. Yet others, such as the Painted Lady, are migratory and can't survive our winters. And we also get occasional migrant species, which aren't yet known to breed here. Things such as the brimstone and the clouded yellow butterflies. And this is a poster I made last year of all the butterflies of Scotland. And we'll talk about the majority of these today, but we won't be dealing with them all. But it shows this: the, these are all produced to, to relative size. You can see it goes the whole way down from large painted ladies and red admirals down to the UK's smallest species, which is the small blue butterfly way down here. And you can see they're broken up into different groups as well. And we'll talk about those groups in the presentation today. So the rest of this course will cover the most common and widespread butterfly species in Scotland. So I'm not going to deal with all of them. For example, out of the brown butterflies, I'll only be talking in detail about four of them out of the nine available species we have in Scotland. Hopefully then you might pick up the others three times. So if you get one of the butterfly guides or have a look on our website, you'll become familiar with some of the more rare species. But these ones are the ones you're likely to see in gardens and parks and places where you're likely to be. And I'll also be breaking it down into groups. So with the white butterflies, for example, you can see that they're all white in color. So mostly white on the wings with black or gray markings. The only real exception to that would be the orange tips, the males of which are have orange tips to the wings, yet the females don't. And the larvae of these in Scotland mostly feed upon plants within the Brassica family. So these, some of these are your so-called cabbage whites, and that does include then your, uh, your cabbages and, and kales and broccolis from the garden, as well as some wildflowers too. Then our second species group are the Lysinidae. So Lysinidae actually comes from the Greek for she-wolf. Nobody knows how it got that name, but we're stuck with it. And with the Lysinidae then, um, these tend to be small and brightly coloured butterflies. And in Scotland, we have one copper species, which is the small copper. We have three blue species and we have three hair streak species. And the one shown there is the green hair streak. And we also have the northern brown argus. With these butterflies, they all tend to be medium to small in size with special scales on their wings, which actually reflect back a lot of light. So that it means that they're extremely brightly colored and they can shimmer in flight. The larvae of these feed upon a variety of different plants and often look very similar to the plants they feed upon. For example, here's a northern brown argus caterpillar feeding upon uh, the leaf of common rock rose. And you can see the caterpillar is almost identical to the plant that it's feeding upon. Then with the browns, the ones we'll be looking at today are shown on the screen here. And you can see that they're mostly brown or slightly orange as well. The larvae of these all feed upon grasses. Some of those are really vigorous grasses and some of them are more fine leaved. Then our next species group are the Vanessids. I tend to think of these as being the, the, the big blousy show off butterflies with many different colors. And these are the ones um, which are extremely common in gardens and parks. And they're very good at flying. So you'll often see them coming to your garden, even if they're not breeding there. And just to make you aware of some of the other groups, which I'm not going to focus in too much detail, but just to say that these things exist. We have the fritillaries. Three of those in Scotland are very similar to this. So they have a mostly orange upper wing with black markings on it. So we have three species which look like that, including the small pearl bordered, pearl bordered and dark green fritillaries. And then we also have the marsh fritillary, which is a fairly rare species and only found on the west coast of Scotland. Then with the skippers, this is a really unusual group of small butterflies with really large heads and large eyes, and they have hooked antennae, so they look quite unlike the other butterflies we see. And you can see here when you, when you zoom in, it's got beautiful little curved eyelashes as well with these really large eyes and the curved antennae, the kind of hooked antennae there, which is extremely unusual. Our other butterflies don't have that feature. So in Scotland, we have three orange species, including the small and large skipper. And there's a very tiny population of the Essex skipper in Dumfries and Galloway. And then we also have the checkered and dingy skipper, both of which are much rarer. And the one on the, foot, on the screen here is the, the dingy skipper. Now, what I'm going to do is show you some of these species in more detail. There's no need to remember them all, all now uh, because I will be sending this out again for you all to have a look at. Really what you want to do is focus on reading a butterfly. So you're looking for certain features which will help you confirm your identification of it, even if you can't remember all of the details. And we'll start with the small white. This is one of the species which is two generations per year, the second generation of which is often darker than the first. So you get a brood emerging in May and June in Scotland, then they disappear around the middle of summer, and then you'll see a second brood towards the end of summer. 
Now, for this species, the important features are the grey wingtips, which don't extend far down the wing edges. So it, it goes really only towards the head of the butterfly, like this, but doesn't go very far down the other wing edge. And you can see it's quite faint, so it's not really that dark. And we can have a closer look at it here. So you can see it's only really going in one direction, and that's important for comparing it to the next species, and I'll be showing you that one in due course. The spots tend not to be strong, but really don't worry too much about spots because it can get confusing because the numbers of spots can differ between the sexes and they can look slightly different over the different generations as well. Generally, though, they're not strong. So if you see the spot it looks quite diffuse here. And they're yellow underneath. So it's got this beautiful bright yellow color on the undersides. And you will see these in gardens and allotments because they're one of the so-called cabbage whites, but you'll also find them in more natural habitats such as riverbanks and woodland edges and places like that. Now let's compare it with the large white. Now unfortunately there's not a huge size difference between the small and large white. Sometimes you get small large whites or large small whites, so you can't always rely on size for these things. Similar to the small white, you have two generations per year, the second of which is often more darkly marked. And if you put the black tips in to the wings, they are strong and extend far down both edges of the wings. So let's just have a look here. So you can see it looks like an L shape, and this is a handy way to remember it. It's like L for large, helps you remember that it's the large white because it's got a big L on its wing there. So that's quite dark as well. So it's on like the other one, which was quite gray, but just be aware that butterflies as they get older will lose some scales. So eventually this will look slightly grayer in appearance. The spots also tend to be quite strong and the males and females do differ. So again, don't worry about counting spots, but just be aware that males have no spots on the upper wings, as you can see here. And it has a pale yellow underside. So this is one of the more typical um, so-called cabbage whites. So this is the one definitely more often associated with cabbage and broccoli. And if you ever want to see one, just go to an allotment um, and look for them because you will see large and small white there together. And hopefully you'll see them in both the same place and be able to separate them. Then the next one is a green faint white. Again, similar to the previous two, this one has two generations per year. It can look very similar to the small white and has variable upper wings. They can either have very fine gray lines, as you can see in the top photo here, or it could have um, darker streaks, as you can see in the bottom two photos. So if you look at the wingtips, so you can separate them from the other two species because they are broken all along. So if, for example, you might've been thinking this could be a, a small white, but if you look here, the wingtips are broken at every section all along, which isn't the case with the other butterflies we met so far. But really the easiest thing to do is to look for the streaky veins on the undersides of the wings, because no other butterfly has this feature. You can see here, it's got these gray veins, either against a nice yellow or green background or against a silvery background. Either way, it still has these streaky veins, which tells you that it's not one of these spe other species, and it's definitely the green veined white. They're mostly absent from gardens, but you can find them in more natural places like woodland edges and riverbanks. They tend not to feed um, upon the cultivated brassicas. And our final white species then is the orange tip. We have a single brood of this species in Scotland, so you'll never see it really beyond uh, the, more, the middle or end of June. You have a single brood which peaks in May and the males are more distinctive. They have these orange tips to the wings, so they're really brightly colored. You can identify them even if you're driving along and you see them on a roadside, you can be sure that it's the orange tip. Yet the females don't have any orange, as you can see in the photograph on the lower one here. If you wanted to identify the females from the upper wing and compare to other butterfly species, you can see that the spots here are kind of like a, like a tadpole before it emerges. That's what, what I think of it. So it's like a tadpole shape. Also, the wings are more rounded compared to the other species. And if you look at the edge, it's got almost like a pearl necklace on the outside. So you can see those little pearls going around the outside, which the other butterflies we met so far don't have. But you can also look at the underside because both sexes, males and females, do have mottled green on the underside, which the other species don't. You can see here um, it's these white patches, but it also has these um, when you see it in life, it looks green, but actually it's black and yellow scales mixed together, which can look green whenever our brain combines them. So the males and females have that, whereas the other butterflies don't. Now onto the brown butterflies, we have the ringlet, first of all. They're quite distinctive by being dark in flight. So when you see one which is freshly emerged, you see this beautiful dark chocolatey color. 
The color though can fade to a lighter brown. Again, as they get older, some scales fall off, they get exposed to the sun, the rain and the wind, um, and they look a wee bit more worn. So just be aware of that. And the eye spots in the upper wing are more variable. Sometimes it can be hard to see. These ones are quite clear because you can see the rings around them there, but sometimes it can just look like a little black dot. So don't always be looking for one just like this. But on the underside, you always have these golden eye spots, which are clearly visible, even in flight, which can help you separate this from other butterfly species. You can see here are these beautiful golden rings, which give the ringlet its name. They have a single brood, which peaks in the month of June, and they're usually associated with places with long, lush grass, including um, damp grasslands, woodland edges and woodland rides. And this is one of the few species which will fly even in overcast or even drizzle. Um, so it's one of the butterflies which can cope with cooler temperatures. So that's the ringlet. But the next common species which would be similar to it would be the meadow brown. Now in flight they might be mistaken for faded ringlets, but with practice and the more that you look at them over time you'll notice that there are some slight differences in the flight patterns between ring ringlets and uh, meadow browns, which are quite difficult to explain without being able to show you in the field, so hopefully it's something that you just build up yourself as you um, get more experience. Generally though what you're looking for is a butterfly with more orange, so if I saw a brown butterfly where, where I was sometimes seeing in flight flashes of orange, I would know for sure that it wasn't a ringlet because ringlets don't have any orange. Whereas the forewing, the underside of the forewing in the meadow brown has orange there and you will notice that in flight. Then if you look at the upper wing though, it's got a single dark eye spot with a white dot in the middle there. And the underside is much plainer too. So there are no golden rings, just a, quite a plain brown background there. The upper side is quite variable though, so sometimes you see them like this where it's quite orange on the upper wing. Sometimes though individuals have much less orange and it's pretty much just brown throughout and that can differ between the sexes. The meadow brown flies from June until August, so it's got a longer flight period than the ringlet and it's usually found in similar habitats. So places with long lush grass, usually in full sun though, and in places where it's slightly drier. You can find them in the same places, but meadow browns will be in the drier spots within the same habitat. Then the small heath. Um, so this is our smallest brown butterfly. Um, it's only about half the size of a meadow brown. So they're quite dainty little things. And actually in flight, they don't look very brown at all. So the upper wing of the species is completely orange, yet we never see the upper wing except in flight because as soon as they land, they close their wings. So this bright orange color here is actually replicated entirely on the upper wings. So in flight, you will see a small orange butterfly fluttering through short dry grassland. But then when they land, they'll go like this, close their wings, and then they can be harder to see. The good news though, is that they don't fly far away. So if you disturb one as you're walking along, it will only fly a few feet away. You can follow them quite easily. And I find that you can get up very close to small heaths without them flying away. So they will though sometimes put their forewing down. So the forewing is open at first, but to help it camouflage itself, then it often tucks the forewing behind the hindwing. And you can see here, it's much harder to see. Heath name is confusing though, you don't just find it in Heathland, you get it in places with sunny short grasslands from May until September. So this is one of those species which emerges earlier and it has two broods per year in Scotland. And it prefers the drier grassland with fine leaved grasses. Now with the speckled wood, so this is a species found in woodland, hedgerows and gardens, always places with trees or shrubs and long grass underneath. So that's what this butterfly needs. And you can find it almost all summer because it has two broods per year, at least two. Some of them, sometimes they have three. And the males will take a prominent perch and defend territories. So they'll be perching upon the trees and any time other insects fly in, they will chase them around. So they're very easy to see because it's a relatively large butterfly as well. Now, the speckled wood is missing from much of central Scotland, but it's spreading every year. This map is now a couple of years out of date, but you can see it was just spreading into Edinburgh at the time. It's now spread through Stirlingshire and into Fife, but we also have had some records recently from the outskirts of Glasgow. So it could be moving in there, in there soon. So definitely keep your eye out for speckled woods if you're in, in some of these central areas this year, and you might be one of the first people to spot it in your area. Now we're on to the next family of the Lycaenidae, and we'll start with the common blue. This is the only widespread blue butterflies in Scotland. Now there are other blue butterflies um, which are more associated with other kind of warm grasslands in Southern England, but you just don't get those species here. So the common blue is our, is our common and widespread one. 
The males of that species are much more conspicuous. They fly a lot more and they're brightly colored. So they're completely bright blue on the upper wing, as you can see here. And they're really easy to spot because they're really a stunning blue color. The males though are more variable. They're usually more brown with a hint of blue. So you can see this individual here. It's brown on the, towards the outer edge of the wing with blue in the center, but some can be much more blue than this. And usually though, they do have the orange markings on the outer edge of the wing here. Um, and if you need to separate it from other similar species, such as the holly blue, which is much less common and always associated with holly and ivy, um, you can just look at the underwings. So the underwings of both sexes have much more bright markings with these orange markings here and white and black circles, as you can see here. Whereas with the holly blue, for example, it only has a plain silvery blue underside with little black dots, none of this fine ornamentation, as you can see here. They fly from June until September, and they're always found in sunny, um, sunny short grassland. So places like uh, coasts and, and flower-rich grasslands are the favorite habitats of common blues. And the caterpillars feed upon a plant called bird's foot trefoil. So we can have a look at that now. This is a really handy way to look for the species, is, is to look for the plant. So bird's foot trefoil is, is within the pea family. You can see the kind of pea-shaped flowers just here. They're yellow and held on these short stalks. And then the seed pods look like this. This is how it gets its name, a bird's foot. So it looks just like the foot of a bird. And again, you get that in coastal dry grasslands and in dry meadows and, it, and even in derelict sites and places like that where it's quite warm and sunny. So that's the common blue. Then the small copper is another one which prefers warm places. You rarely get these in large numbers and that's because the males are regarded as being quarrelsome. So they have little territories and they will chase other butterflies out of their territories. So you see them in just a handful of them, maybe one or two. Um, you might be lucky if you get higher numbers at a site, but don't be expecting lots and lots of small coppers. So they've got a very distinctive upper wing. So you can see here, it's just orange with these little black dots. They're quite small, so it's really hard to describe. So maybe about as big as a 50 pence coin, these would be. Um, and in flight, what you're looking for is a little shimmery butterfly. But then when it lands, you can have a closer inspection and you can see uh, the features here. Sometimes they also have little blue markings on them as well. This one doesn't. Now these are another species which really likes warmer spots. So you'll see them basking in the sunshine on sunny hillsides, usually from May until early October, because this is one of the species with two broods, an early summer and a late summer brood. And they prefer places with um, disturbed ground and rocks to bask upon. So again, you might get them at the coast, but you can also find them at derelict sites um, and along paths and things, wherever there's been a bit of disturbance because they really like to bask on the ground and absorb the heat from the sun. So that's one to look for in sunny spots. Now the green hair streak is a really lovely little butterfly and it's the only green butterfly within the UK. Yet we do have some green moths and it's a it's a fairly small one too and it has wings which are green underneath but brown on top so whenever this butterfly is in flight again it shimmers like the other butterflies we've seen so far so it kind of shines in the sun yet whenever they land they will close their wings and you'll see just green and it's an iridescent green so it changes color depending on what direction the butterfly is facing so it's if it's facing towards you it will look one kind of green if it moves away it will look another kind of green depending upon the angle of the sun and it makes it really well camouflaged against um, birch, if it lands on a birch tree or on a plant of blaeberry. You'll see, you'll sometimes will see them um, chasing other insects, but they will often chase each other, especially the males. So they'll do like a dog fight where they tumble around through the air. And you can see three or four of them doing that sometimes. And it's quite, it's quite funny to watch them just chasing one another away. Easiest way to look for a green hair streak is to look for its habitat first of all, and it's mostly associated with places where you find blaeberry or bilberry growing. This is its main larval food plant in Scotland, and this can be found at the edges of peat bogs or even at, at the edges of some woodland, but it always likes sunny spaces. So for example, if you're at a peat bog, go to the sunniest spot towards the edge, which is quite sheltered from the wind, for example, if there's trees around. Um, and if you find, if you go there, you find blaeberry, then you might also find the green hair streak. Um, now the blaeberry does produce blue berries towards the end of summer, but it has these red flowers early on, usually in May, and that's when this butterfly is flying. So it usually flies around the end of May and into June. And it's such a beautiful little butterfly. Um, its Latin name is Calafris, which means beautiful eyebrows. Um, it's one of my favorites, and I very much hope that you get out to see green hair streaks this year because it's such a treat. 
now we're on to the, the next group, which are the Vanessids. So uh, these are some of the, the more common garden and park species. And for the next three butterflies I'm going to talk about, they have an almost identical lifestyle. So small tortoiseshell can be seen in any month because they overwinter as adults. And you'll see them coming out in March and April. You'll, you'll miss them in midsummer, but then they'll come out again in late summer for the second brood. If you want to identify it then, you'll notice that it has the fresh individuals have wings, which are fringed with blue, and they have much more color on them. So I tend to think of these as being the, like the tortoiseshell cats with all the colors. So it has yellow, black, white, orange, and blue. So really overall, they're a mix of many different colors here, and they're quite a distinctive butterfly. They're not huge, so they're much smaller than red admirals, for example. So don't be expecting a really large butterfly. Um, and they are very well camouflaged with their wings closed, which will help them to hibernate through the winter. In nature, they would have went into caves or culverts or um, in, even into the hollows of trees. And therefore, whenever they close their wings, they look like a dead leaf and that can help them to survive the winter without being eaten by a bird, for example. And the caterpillars of these will feed upon stinging nettles, but the adults come into gardens to feed upon nectar rich plants. Now, almost identical to that then is the peacock. Now the butterfly, the adult butterflies themselves look very different. They have a really striking red appearance with these uh, peacock-like eyes upon, upon the wings. And it can use these to deter predators. And if the peacock is feeling threatened, it can actually rub its wings together and make a hissing noise. And by moving the wings and making them look bigger, it makes the butterfly look larger and hopefully will deter predators from attacking them. Similar to the small tortoiseshell, they overwinter as adults emerging in March and April. The caterpillars also eat nettles and they get an, uh, another brood in late summer and those will overwinter in dry spots. You can see the underside of the wing here, um, again, very similar to the small tortoiseshell and quite almost black in parts, just like a dead leaf. Then we have the comet. So this is much less common than the other two species I've mentioned so far, but it's quite a distinctive butterfly. It has a unique ragged outline to the wings. You can see here, and you can see it really well in this photograph here. So again, it looks just like a dead leaf um, and will stop predators from finding it. And the comet is distinctive by having um, First of all, a really uh, a really beautiful orange color on the upper wings with these black markings, and also the ragged wings will show you as well. And if you look at the underside, you'll you might be able to see this little comma shaped white mark, which is how the comma gets its name. I most often find commas at the edges of woodlands, so um, really kind of woodland glades with nettles around are the favorite spots for this. Again, you get them in springtime. They disappear in midsummer, but then you will also see a late summer brood as well. And in late summer, I very often find them on fallen fruit. So fallen rabbit berries or fallen apples or plums or things like that are some of the favoured foods, sources of sugar for this butterfly in late summer. The caterpillars of this one also eat nettles and they overwinter too. Now we're on to the migratory species. We'll start with painted ladies. This is completely migratory, can't survive our winters at all. Um, some years we get lots, some years we get almost none. And it's quite a distinctive butterfly. For a start, they're quite large. And whenever they're in flight, you'll see them gliding along on these really large wings. Overall, it's got a very pale orange appearance with black and white tips to the wings. And the undersides are quite pale brown. So these are the ones which aren't staying here over winter. So they, they don't need to look like dead leaves. So the undersides are a pale brown and they're not dark like the other species we've seen so far. Um, and yeah, overall painted ladies are extremely easy to identify and hopefully we get some this year in Scotland. Then the red admirals, again, these are mostly migrants. They can breed in Scotland, so they'll breed around the middle of summer and will very often get large numbers in late summer, but they rarely survive our winter. However, this year we've had a few reports of red admirals very early on in the year, and those could have been ones which have survived the winter, but that's very much the exception. We usually tend to get them in very large numbers in late summer in Scotland, usually around September or October time. So they're quite distinctive. They're large. They're almost completely black. So whenever they're in flight, you'll see a really dark butterfly um, in flight, sometimes gliding along on these large wings. And of course, it has these red markings here. These red bands on the wings gives it away because nothing else looks like it. The undersides have a, a mostly a dull salmon kind of salmon pink band. So you can see, if you only see the underside, you'll see this kind of salmon pink band on the underside, which can help you to separate it from other species. And the caterpillars of this one also feed mostly upon nettles. 
Now, just to make you aware of some of the other species to keep an eye out for, these are maybe some of the less common ones, but some that you might live in a place where these are more likely to be found. Things such as the small skipper, which is usually found in areas of tall grass. And I focused on Edinburgh for some of these because in Edinburgh, you can find a lot of species, especially around Hollywood Park. So you can see them in Hollywood and Edinburgh um, where the longer grass grows, but you might also see them along the east coast and in the borders of Scotland. Skippers, these orange little skippers generally look like an arrowhead shape here. The males of those species will have a, a dark line going across them and the skippers don't really look like anything else. So they're quite easy to, to identify or to at least separate from the other butterflies. Then there's a grayling, another one found at Kelton Hill and Holyrood Park in Edinburgh. And this is one which really requires disturbed ground. So its favourite habitats in Scotland are um, sand dunes uh, and quarries and places where there's lots of rocks for it to bask upon, but also for it to be camouflaged. So they're quite large butterflies. In flight, they look orange, but as soon as they land, they will close their wings. So you can see here, it's like this mottled grey appearance. And if that was set against gravel, you really wouldn't see this butterfly at all. It can be difficult to, to spot when it's not flying. Then there's a the small blue, the UK's smallest species. If you're in Scotland, you might find it at coastal sites, such as um, in the borders at St Ab's Head. Um, in Angus, you can see it in Carnoustie. Then there's the Murray and Caithness Coast. But in the West Coast, it has been reintroduced to Irvine. So that's um, one to keep an eye out for if you're along some of these coastal spaces and usually flies in late May and June. The thing with small blue though, is that it isn't very blue at all. So don't be looking for a bright blue, blue butterfly. It's a very dark, um, almost a gray blue with a few blue scales here. Then of course there's the holly blue. And for some reason, holly blue is very uncommon in Scotland, yet it's much more common in other parts of the UK where it's even a garden butterfly there. Um, you will find it in places like Ayr, um, Edinburgh, East Lothian and the borders. And it's always associated with holly and ivy, which are the caterpillar food plants. It comes out twice a year, so you see it in early spring and then in late summer again. Um, whereas with the common blue, it's usually soon around midsummer and is also always associated with flower rich grassland and coasts, whereas the holly blue is associated with woodlands where holly and ivy grow. Then other ones again, so we got the northern brown argus, another one of the lysinid butterflies, and these are small. They're quite darkly colored, but the distinctive thing about this species is, is that it has two white marks in the upper wings. You can see here, these little white dots. So you might confuse it, for example, with a female common blue, which can be brown just like this, um, but you're looking for these little white markings just here. Again, if you're in Edinburgh, you might find it in Holyrood Park and other spaces where common rock grows, grow, grows because it's the caterpillar plant for the species. Then one of the fertilities I've chosen is the more widespread one. It's the small pearl border fertility. And this can be found in places where marsh violet or dog violets are found. So you can find it in places like damp grasslands, edges of peat bogs and on hillsides as well. Then we have the wall butterfly, which in Scotland is more associated with coastal areas and places with gravel and rocks that it can bask upon. And then there's a large heath. So this is the one associated with raised bogs where the caterpillars can feed upon Hare's Hill cotton grass. Um, you can separate it from the small heath, which is very similar, but most of our large heaths will have black spots on the upper undersides of the wings just here. Now, hopefully that's whetted your appetite for learning more about butterflies. And you'll notice that I haven't covered everything in detail, but if you want to find out more, these are some of the books I'd recommend. The first two, so the one on the left and the one in the middle, are two excellent field guides. So these are ones to take out with you, put it in your rucksack and take it out with you on a day when you're going out to look for butterflies. They have excellent illustrations. They have the times of year for butterflies. They have um, and more information about their ecology and life cycles. Then if you want to learn a lot more, this book, The Life Cycles of British and Irish Butterflies, really focuses more upon the, the different stages. So the caterpillars and the chrysalises, but also has excellent information on photographs. And I'd highly recommend that as a good coffee table book or a good birthday present for somebody, because it's, a, it's not one to take outside. It's one more to sit inside and, and to pour over because it's an excellent book. So I'd highly recommend those. Thank you for listening. And you can find out more about butterfly identification from our website.